Welcome to this presentation on the direct formulation of a finite element problem. Uh, today we'll be going through the uh, finite element method basic steps. So I've introduced these um, during our introductory uh, presentation. And so we'll be going through these with specifically with the direct method, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit. Uh, but the pre-processing steps, we'll do the discretization of step one. Uh, we'll have the shape functions, the element equations, assembly, and system constraints, followed by our solution phase, all right, solving for what we want to find, and then doing some post-processing. So again, we'll go into um, the specifics, specific, excuse me, the specifics of each of these, and I'll have um, details about what we'll be doing, introducing each section. So again, we'll come back to this several times throughout the presentation. All right, so there's three different uh, ways we can formulate finite element problems. Uh, the one we're talking about today is direct formulation. So we'll focus that on this presentation. Uh, the next presentation will be on the uh, minimum total, poten uh, total potential energy formulation. And then finally, after that, we'll talk about the weighted residual. And actually, there's several different weighted residual methods. So let's get into the direct method so we can see what we're talking about here. All right. Um, before we get too much further, uh, which to choose, make sure you check out the handout. And actually, for this whole presentation, as well as the next one on the minimum total potential energy, check out the link in the description where it tells where you can download the handout for this presentation. Uh, and then I'll give you a little description about how you choose which one, but a lot of that's not beyond the scope of this class. Uh, but make sure you check that to get uh, an idea where to, basically how that would work uh, when you get to industry and, and do some nitty gritty formulations. All right, so direct formulation, we're gonna go through this example of this uh, bar we have. So if we have this bar here, whoops. Uh, this bar here with this, this shape, it's attached up here at the wall, so we can say it's fixed up here. All right, so it's a variable cross section. It's fixed at the upper end there. It supports a load down here at P to 1,000 pounds, and we got some modulus of elasticity that's given here at 10.4 times 10 to the sixth. All right, for the dimensions, uh, those are all given, which we'll uh, substitute those in later when we are solving our problem. Uh, what we're trying to find here, ignoring the weight of our, our bar, is the deflection U and the stress uh, that we'll need to calculate that's occurring within our, our bar here. All right, so let's look at how we're going to do that direct formulation. All right, so the first step of uh, finite element method is discretization. We need to subdivide the problem into nodes and elements. So let's go do that. All right, so discretization. Here's our, our bar of variable cross-section. And so we discretized it into the number of nodes. So we got node one up here is right where the wall is. So the connection of the bar with the wall. And then two, three, four, five, and five being down here at the tip. Now, the number of these is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, you'll get more practice with that as we go through this presentation or through this class, through this course about how many nodes do I have and you get some experience about what, what's uh, appropriate. All right, so we've subdivided into our five nodes, and because of the, where these five nodes are located, and we're making this kind of a one-dimensional problem, uh, they result in four elements. All right, so the way these elements are defined is we have these areas that exist between, this would be node five and node four, oops, and node four, all right, so there's this whole element that exists right here, element four, all right, and then three, two, one is their label here. Um, and as you can see here, the way we discretize it, we're not going to get this variable cross section that we have here. It's going to be a constant cross section, and we'll talk about more what that is. All right, but you can see then if we would break this down into more than five nodes, if we had maybe a node in here, and we had a node in here, and a node in here, et cetera, et cetera, um, these cross sections, as we break, add more and more nodes, it would more look, look like this variable cross section piece. All right, so that's why it says here accuracy would increase with more nodes and elements. All right, but to keep things simple, we're just going to go with five here, five, five nodes. All right, the element uh, area, as I mentioned, already is a cro uh, constant cross-section, and it'll be based on the average of the area between that we have here at uh, node five and the area here we have at node four. And again, we'll come back to this. Um, in between our nodes, so node four, node five, or in all these cases, we basically have these elastic springs that are going to represent what's happening in the way the motion of our little bar sections here. All right. And then we'll look at the displacement of the nodes at each, at the, the displacement at each node. So we're going to keep it generic and calling 
each node location node i. All right, so that's the discretation set. So we were able to subdivide our problem into nodes and elements. So now we're going to look at shape functions. All right, so look at the shape function. Assume a function to represent the physical behavior of the element. So uh, possibly assume or possibly using our engineering knowledge to create a function uh, to represent the physical behavior of the element. So if you're looking at this, you might be thinking, well, already I can see a lot of things that are going to be happening. We're going to have some original length of our, of our element. And then it's going to be um, displaced some distance. And then so it's going to be uh, some additional length change. And you can maybe remember what that might be from a previous class. All right, we'll come back to that. The other thing we have here is we have this force all right, being applied over this area of our element. That too might ring a bell. All right, so maybe the average normal stress. So if we look at uh, what the sigma value is, this average normal stress is our force applied over the area of that element. In addition, we have our average normal strain, right, from these two length changes, or the original length, we have the change in length over the original length gives us our average normal strain, right? So key behavior of what's happening with our element. And we're using those together to hopefully come up with this K equivalent, some spring constant that's equivalent to what's happening um, with our element. All right, so if linear elastic, we're going to assume linear elastic in this case, but if linear elastic, then Hooke's law applies. And Hooke's law says that we take our stress is equal to the modulus times our strain. So let's just make that substitution for the stress. We substitute in our force per unit area here, and we have our modulus, and then we substitute in the strain, our change in length over the original length. All right, solve for the force. Huh, this looks interesting. So we got force is equal to something times a length or change in length or f is equal to k times x that's the spring constant or our equivalent spring constant we're coming up with times this change in length how far do we stretch our spring All right so from that we can see that elements are elastic springs with an equivalent stiffness or constant of k equivalent is our area of our spring or in this case our bar times the modulus divided by the overall length of our uh, element. All right, so this is really important for us as we develop these shape functions. Uh, how, what are the functions that are going to define how our, our shape or our, sorry, our object moves, our elements move? All right, so let's get a little bit more in depth in our spring modeling. So the modeling each spring element now, we're going to take as our force times our spring constant times the change in the displacement, uh, displace, the node displacements. So what's going on here? Well, let's, let's draw out our one of our elements. All right, so we got our little tapered, tapered uh, section going on here. And we're gonna have the displacement at node i up here. And we have the displacement here at node i plus one. Right, so the force is is equal to the k. Right, the k equivalent of this material, or we could say the modulus. Right, there's some elasticity in there. All right, but if this uh, displacement moves down this far, and this uh, node only moves, oops, only moves this far. Right, we can see how if we subtract this displacement, we subtract sorry this this the node at uh, displacement at node i. Right, which is right here. If we subtract that from our use of i plus one, the displacement at this node, you can see how it's a positive value. That's where we're subtracting use of i from use of i plus one. Right? That's why our force is, is set up like that. All right, so the k equivalent from the previous slide, we said is our a, is just the area, so it's actually our average area times the modulus over our length. So here's our length of our element. So it's just the length of that element there. We have the modulus in here. All right, but this A average, that comes from, we're going to take the area at I plus one. So the area at I plus one. And we're going to uh, add the area at node I and divide by two. So we get the average area of our little tapered rod section. And we still have our E over L and the change in the displacements. All right, so if we collect all those terms there, all right, they come out to be our equivalent 
spring constant. So we already had this before, it's just we're, we're expanding out our average area, determining what that was. All right, you can see all the definition of terms that we have down here. All right, so that's the development of our uh, shape function. It's describing how the, the basically the shape, uh, we'll see this more as we can look at future presentations, but the overall shape of our element and how it responds to uh, what's being applied to our bar, which is a horse. All right, so that's our shape function. Now we're looking at our element equations. So we're going to develop the mathematical equation for each element, all right? Uh, so let's go see what that's involves here. All right, so here's our uh, overall force that's being applied at one node. And the same force or similar force is being applied at the other node, all right, based on the displacements um, of the nodes involved in the same element. So this is a free body diagram, FBD, of each element. So because we have, it's made up of two nodes, so we got node I and node I plus one. So the forces being applied on your side here. And this is the I plus one minus U sub I. This one's I minus I plus one. Right? So why the flip around? Well, because in this case, the force we want to be positive if we're going uh, in the positive Y direction. And similar to down here, we want this to be positive in the positive Y direction. So to get that, we're going to have to switch out the, the, the way we subtract those two U values. All right, so those are the nodal uh, forces. So the forces on elements at nodes, I and I plus one. So we're gonna combine those. Right? So we have our, our same two equations here, and now we're gonna combine them and we're gonna rearrange them. Right? So that both these errors are saying, we're gonna rearrange these guys so that we put U sub I in this column. And in this column, we're gonna have U I plus one, all the U I plus one terms. So here's the U sub I terms. All right, so U sub I term here, U sub I term here, and U I plus one, U I plus one term there. All right, and what we're doing is we're setting these up so that we can get them in matrix form. All right, and uh, you see that note there pop, note the form, but we'll come back to that. All right, so you see here, here's the K equivalent, positive K equivalent here, and here's the negative K equivalent, so that's right here. And then likewise on the, in the, um, the second row there. And we can recreate these two equations because we multiply these out, we're gonna take this uh, row and multiply it by this column here and we'll recreate this equation uh, equal to F sub I, all right? What we're noting about the form is what do we see here? These are all forces. These are all spring constants. These are all displacements, all right? And so what we end up having here is this is a load matrix is equal to our stiffness matrix, how stiff are each one of those pieces, uh, each of our elements, and multiplied by the displacement matrix. All right, we're gonna work on this. We'll see this again and again and again. All right, so this is the putting together our, putting it all into elemental form. All right, so that was step three, or putting and getting our element equation. Now, how many elements did we have? We think back to when we discretized, we had four elements. All right, now we need to put all those elements together because they share different nodes. Between some of the elements, they share nodes. So step four is the assembly of all those elemental equations so we get them all uh, connected and so they can model the entire system that we're looking at, which is our tapered, uh, tapered bar. All right, so here's the assembly process. For element one, all right, so element one was right all the way at the top. So if we draw our tapered bar here again, and we got one, two, three, and four. So one, two, three, and four. So this is all for element one up top here. All right? It's got it's got uh, node one. Here's node one, and here is node two. There we go, two. All right? So this is made up of uh, those spring constants. And now this this equation, these aren't part of the equation here. Uh, what they are is just to show that this row, the first row, has to do with u one. And the second row has to do with U2. So they're not actually being part of this. There's not any matrix math going on here. It's just to represent what those, um, what those rows correspond with. All right, for element two now, we have the stiffness uh, values, the K values there uh, for element two. And they represent or work with node two, as we look up in the picture here, and node, node three. And we continue this analysis in a similar way with our elements uh, three and four. 
and we continue to do this. So we're going to uh, assemble now our global matrix equation. So these were all element, right, element stiffness matrices. Now we're going to do our global uh, matrix equation. We can do it in either ways. We can have our load matrix kind of here on the left side, and then stiffness matrix, our displacement matrix, or we just flip things around. We got our stiffness matrix over here now, uh, then displacement matrix, and then our load matrix. All right, let's go ahead and do that assembly here. All right, so the matrix displacement, the matrix or the displacement matrix is going to just have all the displacements. So we got it for node one, two, three, four, and five. That's all going to be in a uh, column matrix. Now when we uh, uh, develop our global stiffness matrix for each element, this is the part that's going to take um, kind of take some time to, to kind of just wrap our heads around here. So again, these are all representative values here. So everything in this column right here, these are all representative. They're not actually part of the matrix map. But everything in this first row are representations of displacement one, all right? And then displacement two, three, four, five for each corresponding row. So if we look at just what element one was, element one was only made up of nodes one and node two. All right, so if they're only made up of nodes one and two, we can almost look across the top too and say, hey, this is node one, this is node two, this is node three, node four, and node five. So if we look at where one and two correspond with one and two, they all are, will represent only what is from element one. All right. So then if we go to element two, where do you think element two is going to be? Because element two consisted of node two and node three. So where do you think it's going to end up in this matrix? All right. well, if we recognize it's going to be in here. All right. So here is the element stiffness matrix for element two. So they're one, two, three, four, five. We can look at where two and three line up with two and three, and we'll see that they are just going to make up those four cells of our entire matrix. All right, we'll do this again as well for um, element three as well as element four, put them in this form. So when we add them all together, all right, so we look at our overall global stiffness matrix, it's just going to be the sum of all four of our element matrix, but we have to put them in the global form because we want to add them up, add up correctly, right? Because we want to put them all in these four by, or sorry, five by five matrices so we can add them all up. Because look what happens. Remember that element one, let me draw this up again, right? So here's our overall tapered rod. We have one, two, three, four elements. And we have, we'll just do node one, node two, and node three. Now check it out, element one, and element two both share node number two. And now check it out. Here is how that sharing looks. So this right here, this is element one. That's it's elements one stiffness matrix. And here's element two stiffness matrix. Actually, it should go in here. And this one should kind of slant like this and just grab K1 there. All right. So you can kind of see that whole slant go the whole way through here. So here's element three. All right, and here's element four. All right, so that's how they all combine into this global stiffness matrix. And we can take into account what's all happening there. So that's all the assembly phase. So now what we want to do is apply our system constraints, apply our boundary conditions and initial conditions and loading. All right, so applying the constraints. So if you go back to the problem statement at the beginning of you know several slides ago, what you'll see is that we said that our tapered rod. Our taper rod was fixed at the top here. So we were fixed across the top here. And that is where node number one is located. So therefore the displacement of node number one, uh, boundary condition says that that is equal to zero. All right, so that's our boundary condition there. And then we had our loading. So our loading right here, uh, P is a thousand pounds. So that's where the other constraint comes from. All right, so now when we take our equation, we put in our global stiffness matrix, multiply our, by our displacement matrix as equal to our load matrix, we come up with this. All right, so what we did here is we, sub, we plugged in the one. All right, the one here is for this um, boundary condition. And our 10 to the third here, that's a thousand, that represents the thousand pounds, right, that comes from our loading. 
So the top row of the stiffness matrix was changed so that u1 equals zero. Now we need to do this because of the banner condition. We need to say when we take this entire row, first row of our stiffness matrix, and we multiply it by this column matrix, we're going to get just u1 is equal to zero. I kind of missed that here. Let me get another circle on that. It's equal to our zero value here. All right, so that is how we apply our bounding condition. We knock out everything else in the row, make it all zeros. Really, it was just this value here, but make, make them all zeros, and then put a one in this first, um, or whatever cell that we're interested in. Um, but in this case, we wanted U1 to equal zero. All right, and we'll talk about some specific um, ways of doing that as we go forward. All right, but that's how we apply those bounding conditions here. All right, so finally, after those, then that's all the pre-processing phase. So now we're actually going to solve for our primary unknowns. So we can do the solution phase here. All right, we're going to solve it. We got our uh, K equivalents. So we got our average area, AI plus 1 plus AI times the modulus, all divided by 2L. Plug in all the values and come up with our equivalent spring, um, stiffness value for each of our elements, 1, 2, three and four. All right, so we got those values, so now we can plug in them all into our stiffness, global stiffness matrix. And just to note here, this 10 to the third, because that looks a whole lot like P, that is not P. That is just, this is 975,000. And uh, so I put 10 to the third out front here. All right, that is not P. P does not show up in the stiffness matrix. Okay, so where it does show up is right here. All right, so here's our, this is our uh, stiffness matrix here, this is our displacement matrix, and this is our load matrix. So that's where the 1,000 uh, pounds for P comes in. All right, so again, make sure your units are consistent throughout. This is very important. MathCAD does a great job of units in most cases, and we can do it for a couple of the simple examples uh, for when we for the first couple of weeks in this class. After that, um, because you know, start getting mixed, we can't. And so you just got to be careful as you apply them, as you put stuff together, that your units are consistent. All right. So if you go ahead and solve this, you can use uh, whatever method you prefer uh, from the uh, last lecture from linear algebra. Um, but ultimately, you should end up with this. So maybe you know, throw this equation in and see what you come up with. Make sure you come up with these results here. Uh, check your work there. All right. So we came up with the displacements. We've done our initial solving. That's the solve phase. All right. So now we want to do is calculate our derived variables. So everything else, kind of missed it there, but everything else we're going to do is from our displacements. Everything else that we want, information is going to come from just those displacements and, and the other information we have from the problem statement. All right, so let's get those things. So here's the post-processing phase. What we wanted to find was the stress, all right, that's, that's occurring in our tapered rod here. So the stress is just force uh, over area. And so we're going to do that. We got our force equation for, uh, for each node. So we got our equivalent k constant, and we have the difference in the displacements at each of the nodes divided by the average area. All right, we substitute in for our equivalent, um, equivalent stiffness or equivalent k constant. So the average areas are going to cancel out. And all we need to do is if we can get the modulus and we have our displacements divided by the length, we'll get our stress. All right, we have the modulus, we have the length, those are given. And the displacements we just calculated in step six. All right. And uh, just kind of a, somewhat of an aside, look at the interesting thing here. This is uh, Hooke's Law, right? We got the stress times the modulus times, what's this value? Well, that would be the strain, right? And the strain is the change in length, right? This change in displacement is divided by the original length. That's nice how that worked out. All right, so calculating the normal stress in each element, we put substituting the values. So we got the modulus being substituted in here. And then we have our change in displacements. So here is U2 minus U1. Again, U1 is zero, right? Because that was the boundary condition. It's not moving, it's attached to the wall. And it's all divi divided by the original length of the element, not of the whole tapered bar, because we're just finding the stress in that element. All right, and you can see how we do that for all the subsequent elements that we have. All right, another thing we want to find, which actually, if, if this were mentioned on that first slide, we're going to find the reaction force. All right, here's method one. Uh, we do an FBD over all of element one. 
and we say, okay, here's here's where it's attached to the uh, wall, and then we have some force applied here. And so the force would be equal to the stiffness of our spring uh, multiplied by that change in displacement between the two nodes. And if we do the sum of the forces, because this is a static case, the sum of the forces in the y direction, so here's y, the y direction has to equal zero. Then we say, hey, whatever this force is, plus the reaction force up here, uh, better equal zero. All right, so we got our force um, that's being applied here. It's just going to be our uh, stiffness value for element one times the change in displacement plus R. All right, we have all those values. We have our stiffness value we calculated from before. We have U2 minus U1. Uh, we can solve for R, which is minus 1,000 pounds, which is expected because you had 1,000 pounds applied at the other end uh, of our whole tapered, uh, yeah, our whole tapered bar. So we got um, R acting up here with 1,000 pounds. All right, so that's method one, just a nice FBD kind of analysis. For method two, what we do is draw an FBD of each node and then write the equilibrium, equilibrium equations for each node. Again, some of the forces equal to zero. And then we're going to assemble all those into a matrix uh, equation of the form. The reaction matrix, mat, reaction matrix equals the stiffness matrix times the displacement matrix minus the external load matrix. So that's what it looks like here in, in the matrix term. So there's reaction, stiffness, displacement minus our external load matrix. And we can then solve for our external reactions, which is our first term here. All right. Why do why don't we just do method one? It's, it seems like it'll be a lot more, a lot simpler than method two. Well, for this case, because it's so simple, yeah, it just do method one, much quicker, simple, less prone to mistakes. For method two, right, as we break it out here, right, these are all the equations we really have to develop. So the sum of the forces for each node. So again, why are we doing this versus method one? Well, for method two, it's going to be something where it's a much more complex shape where the force is being applied in more than one direction and be very hard to just kind of see right off. Um, might may, Again, maybe multiple connection points. Maybe it's not just connected to one wall. Um, so again, this is starting very simple so you can see the principles um, for what would be applied to a more complex case. So anyways, these are the FBDs for each node. So node one from before we got the reaction force acting up and then our stiffness times the change in displacements and the equivalent thing going on down at the bottom, where here we have our applied load um, versus its load being applied from um, element above it. All right, so we have all of our equations here. We're going to put them all together for um, so some of the forces in the y direction. So we get R1 minus uh, K1, U2 minus U1, and we're saying that positive is in the upward direction. All right, so we go put our equations together like so, all right? And now we're gonna take all our equations and we're gonna rearrange them and put them in matrix form. So again, we're gonna combine, put all the terms, all right? Uh, in for U1 here in the first category, then U2, and we got U3, U4, and then U5. Right? And then we have our equations for node one, I get right this way, node one, node two, node three, node four, and node five. Right, so we similarize all into our matrix. So again, we get our stiffness matrix like before. All right, big stiffness matrix, our displacement matrix, and our reaction, as well as our uh, load matrix here. All right, so note the form again, stiffness matrix, displacement matrix, and now we have loads and reactions in the same matrix because of the uh, some of the forces in the y direction that you're using. So it's important to distinguish distinguish the loads from the reactions. Loads are known, reactions are not. That's what we're trying to figure out is the reactions. All right. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to separate out the forces from the reactions by saying, hey, we're going to sum these two. So we can do it this way, or we can uh, take the force to the other side. Right? Take it this, this side of the equation, so it would be minus the forces, and that's essentially what's done um, in this case right here. All right. The reason we like this kind of the second case is because now we've isolated the reactions by themselves. So if we do that, we solve for the reaction forces, and we find that at node one, it's 
negative p, which is what we found. All right, so just reviewing all the steps we went through, we did the discretization, which we'd have to do for any of our formulation methods, not just this, this specifically we looked at in this presentation was the direct method, um, but discretization is going to be the same for, for any of the methods. Uh, the way things are more specific just to the direct is going to be that shape function as well as the element equations. Assembly is pretty much universal between all, all three, uh, as well as system constraints. And then yep, solving is just the matrix math and then doing our calculations. All right, so we got to do all that, see how that works for the direct formulation. So I hope you come back to the next presentation where we look at total minimum total potential energy formulations.